Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to At Home with Hayley. I am, of course, Hayley Andrews. Um, if you can pop in your chat box that you can hear me loud and clear, that would be great. Just to make sure that everybody is live, everybody can hear me. Not seeing any chat coming through. I can see people joining. Can you hear me, guys? Girls? Hello. Right. Okay. People are saying they can hear me now. Fantastic. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to At Home with Hayley. It is our last At Home with Hayley for 2021. Um, as many of you know, I am wrapping up um, uh, to uh, enjoy the Christmas festivities. I absolutely love Christmas. And uh, today is kind of my last official day of delivering any sort of training like this. Um, and um, I'm very much excited to start getting tucked into the mince pies, eggnog, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, mulled wine, although I'm not, not really a fan. Um, I'm that traditional, I'll drink it anyway. <laughs> so good morning and welcome. I can see everybody coming through. Let us know where you're dialing in from. That would be fantastic. Um, say hi in the chat box. Um, and we'll get kind of... Uh, on with today's show. So whether you uh, can notice, I'm actually not at home today. Um, so I'm in the training facility in the north of Birmingham, so uh, YFE headquarters. And the reason I'm here today is because I'm actually viewing an amazing property after I finished with you guys. Um, and um, it is one of my fantasy projects, which is um, uh, super exciting for me. Um, and I was just uh, filling uh, Nick in on the deal. And uh, what, what I'm looking to do is uh, open up my first ever uh, nightclub. Uh, so wine bar, internet cafe, um, and serviced accommodation. So uh, super, super excited about that. So wish me luck. Um, and uh, this is a museum that I've been visiting for many, many years as a child. Um, I've taken taken my son there as well and uh, hopefully we'll be able to repurpose it and uh, get on with my uh, fun time project. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce you to our special guest this uh, month. Um, so many of you may already know him, uh, but Nick, are you there? So we have the wonderful Nick Burns of Lighthouse FX, who is not wearing any Christmas uh, kind of... <laughs> I didn't get the memo. That's the only reason. <laughs> you didn't get the memo. Okay, I'll let you off. Um, so and we might have to uh, get a Christmas, squeeze a Christmas carol out of you uh, before the end of the day. <laughs> I'm running you way before that? then. <laughs> How's your singing voice this morning, Nick? Terrible, as always. Well, you don't want to hear. <laughs> You're in good company then, because mine's terrible as well. Right, welcome Nick, and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we've got a smaller audience than normal, uh, but many of you listen, of course, on the replay. So if you do have questions, pop them in the chat box. Nick is going to be talking to you today about um, the uh, overall economy here in the UK. Um, while I am lighting, uh, loading your slides, Nick, do you want to, just for those that, that perhaps have never met you before and doesn't know, don't know that you are Nick Burns of, you know, Lighthouse FX, one of your Freedom Empire's favourite, favourite uh, power team members. <laughs> um, do you want to introduce yourself while I uh, sort your slides out? Yeah, yeah. so, uh, I, I mean, there's a few familiar uh, names that I can see. Um, so hello to everyone that does know me. Um, but yeah, so I, I run Lighthouse FX and we're a, we're a currency brokerage predominantly. Um, so we help clients uh, move money internationally at bank meeting exchange rates and help manage risk and, uh, and, and, and smooth the process. Um, but of course, as part of what we do, we have to be keeping an eye on the economy and uh, as a gauge as to what direction or trends we're going to likely to follow in the currency markets. So, um, so yeah, as you say, I'm going to be talking just broadly about the economy really today. Um, linked to currency because that is predominantly where I specialise, but um, but really kind of a, a broad angle of what's going on, um, what to look out for, a couple of things that we've got coming up, um, and yeah, and what's been what's been going on over the last little while. Yeah, sure. I lost your slides for a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a little bit of a panic attack. <laughs> um, let me just uh, message admin to say we're okay. 
we're done. <laughs> I was just, where are the slides? <laughs> right, that was a great introduction. Thanks for kind of filling in there. <laughs> but I'm going to pop off camera and enjoy your market update as usual. Of course, after Nick, um, can you see your slides, Nick? Are you? I can see my first slide, yeah. And if you click on slides, you should be able to click next. So you want to just check that. Um, so uh, there, there we go. go. Fantastic. Right. So I'm going to jump off camera. Um, guys and girls, if you have any questions um, about what Nick talks about or anything in general, pop it into the chat box and we will have time after the market update to go through all of the questions with you. Over to you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, well, this one we can skip over, I guess. Um, so, um, so yeah. So the UK economy. So, um, so basically, the two main things uh, that have been occurring over the last few years uh, and that continue to impact things moving forward as well um, are Brexit and the coronavirus pandemic and the, and the subsequent lockdowns. Um, and both have had a significant impact. Um, well, arguably... Um, the, Nick, the Nick Hello? I'm so Hello? sorry. I've got messages in the chat box to say that they can't hear you. Can oh, people please come? Yeah. So we've got a few people. Of course, we've got lots of people that dial in from different parts of the world. Um, can we just confirm that we can all hear Nick? I can hear him perfectly fine. Um, somebody just pop in the chat box that we can, can you hear, hear Nick. Don't, oh, somebody's put don't, I can hear okay. perfectly fine. Okay, fantastic. So, yes, everybody's coming through. They can hear you. So sorry to jump in. Cool. Right. No, okay, no, no. Continue. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Cool. Um, so, um, so yeah, so the, the lockdowns, um, not necessarily, it's not necessarily the, the virus itself. It's the lockdowns that impact the, the economy. Um, because, of course, when people are uh, not able to go to work, the, the economy is less productive. And so, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the sort of main bad thing, as it were. Um, well, you know, for the economy. Um, so um, the official figures from the Office for National Statistics confirmed earlier in this, uh, well, sorry, in, in November, apologies, uh, that the economy remains around 0.6% between below the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and that's despite a, a really significant recovery uh, following a really significant dip in in, in activity of, of 25%. Um, so that's kind of how much um, the, these lockdowns have impacted things. You know, 25% of GDP has been, been absolutely massive. It's been, been ridiculous. Um, but we are, as far as the UK goes, we're, we're showing some really strong signs of life, uh, or have been. Um, our vaccination rollout has been sort of uh, widely regarded as one of the best in the world. Um, we've got a, around about 75% of the population have been vaccinated now. And the belief, of course, is that that uh, enables us to or uh, diminishes the likelihood of further lockdowns. Um, and uh, and yeah, so and uh, there was a report the other day as well that um, yesterday, in fact, um, that we are expected to be the fastest growing G7 economy through next year. Uh, something like 6.9%, I believe. I didn't put the stats on here. Uh, apologies, it came out after I wrote this. But um, but yeah, fastest growing G7 economy next year, apparently. Um, so Brexit and the economy. So so Brexit was the one the one big thing before the pandemic reared its like, ugly head. Uh, that was the real kind of market driver and um, uncertainty hanging over the British economy. Um, we, of course, got a deal December 2020. Um, so we've not really, of course, we've not really had um, a proper run at things. So we're not really sure how the Brexit is going to is going to impact things in the long term, um, because of course we've had this massive disruption. So so, so Brexit is really a, a lingering uncertainty that's going to hang over the economy for a little while. Um, possibly we do very well. Possibly we we struggle significantly. Um, Earlier in the year, we had what we what we referred to and what the media referred to as the, the pandemic. So essentially people being pinged on their app that they've been in close contact with someone with coronavirus and thus needs to um, to isolate for a little while. Um, again, not being able to go to their jobs. Uh, and the, the biggest kind of headline grabber on that was the was the, the shortage of lorry drivers. Uh, but it led to disruptions on the petrol forecourts. There was no petrol in petrol pumps uh, or, or panic buying, uh, at least. 
Um, and uh, there's been reports of food shortages and all this kind of stuff. Um, real, uh, I mean, I would, I would argue more kind of headline grabbing stuff than than, than real um, uh, real damaging impact. Um, but nevertheless, the disruption to the economy and and and, and uncertainty. Um, we of course can now negotiate trade deals independently. Um, we've done rollover deals, uh, so essentially just uh, an extension of our relationship with the, the sort of EU and uh, and whatnot. We've signed new deals with Australia, Japan, New Zealand, um, and of course looking at the US uh, with a little bit on the back burner since Biden won um, the election. But uh, but nevertheless, so we we and I think that's a positive thing. Um, I, I think that um, you know free trade deals with much of the rest of the world that perhaps we're, because we're it's the it's like the analogy of the the cruise ship and the speedboat. You know the the EU is the equivalent of the of the cruise ship. It takes a long time to turn and um, and, and 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 agree deals because they've got to get everything signed off by the twenty seven member states. As an independent um, country. We can now negotiate quite quickly uh, trade deals with with other com- countries, so uh, it puts us in quite a good position, I think. Um, there there will be some people that disagree um, and and say that Brexit was bad, but I, I think it was not such a bad thing at all. Um, so the lingering uncertainties. So there's still uncertainty as to whether the services sector. So we haven't actually agreed. We, we've done a rollover deal with the services sector. It's the UK's biggest kind of money earner as far as the treasury goes. Uh, and tax incomes. Um, there's still uncertainty as whether the services sector is going to have access to EU clients. Um, so this is this is quite a big one. It's one that's not really hitting the the papers quite so much as um, as, as other aspects of bre- Brexit. But it's 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 potentially quite a large one one to follow. Uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol as well remains a real issue. Um, it was one of the big kind of hurdles to the deal. That was signed last year, and um, we've had some we've had some issues with it. And um, there was the what they called the sausage war, what the media called the sausage war. So essentially, the the the, the official border between the EU and the UK runs along the the Irish Sea. Uh, so basically, it's cutting off Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. And so, there, and, and because of the Good Friday Agreement, you can't. Well, the Good Friday Agreement states basically that you can't have a border separating uh, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, and so this represents a bit of an issue because, of course, goods travelling between the EU, Republic of Ireland, and the UK, Northern Ireland, um, are uh, they, they need checks. Uh, they need to be um, correctly documented, etc., 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 for tax reasons, VAT reasons, X, Y, and Z. Um, and it's a real, it's a real, it's a real issue, um, and for some reason, it just um, both basically both sides have now threatened to uh, trigger what they call Article Sixteen, um, and effectively could throw the entire Brexit agreement out the window. I mean, that's kind of sensationalist. I don't think it's going to get to there, but uh, nevertheless, both sides are slinging some really quite. Um, hard rhetoric around uh, and continue to do so and that's just not going to go anyway uh, go away anytime soon they keep knocking the deadline to have an ag- agreement further down the road uh, which gives us some uh, respite but um nevertheless it's a, it's an ongoing issue and one to follow um there's been chat of um teething issues at the borders as well most of the clients that i speak to that do business with the eu um actually found it quite easy um, I've, I've not really had anybody that says it's a real blooming issue. Uh, essentially, there's a couple more forms that people need to, that, that companies and, and lorry drivers need to fill in. Um, so, so yeah. But there's there's reports in the media that that there are that there are issues. It's, it's not that I've come across, but but nevertheless, uh, worth mentioning. Uh, and and basically, as far as currencies go, um, uncertainty and and not just currencies, just the broad economy as well to an extent. Um, uncertainties are not a good thing. So they, uh, linking it to the pound, it brings the value of the pound down, um, stops people or makes people more hesitant to invest, perhaps, uh, you know, companies and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I see it as, a, as an opportunity, essentially. But, but, but yeah. Uh, so coronavirus impact. So um, obviously everyone will be aware of uh, what's been going on. I'd be quite shocked if you weren't aware that there's been a pandemic in the 
in the, in the last couple of years. Um, so we went into lockdown in uh, in March 2020. Uh, the Bank of England slashed interest rates to 0.1%, the lowest it's ever been, uh, and upped its bond buying programme to £85 billion pound per month, which sounds like a huge amount. But in comparison with the with the US and, and some other state, it, uh, some other places, it's, it's uh, not all that much. But nevertheless, £85 billion pounds flooding into the economy every month. Um, many schemes were, were launched to help the to help support the economy through the through the pandemic and the lockdowns. Um, one of the main ones was the furlough scheme. So uh, essentially, everyone that was unable to work. So the obvious example that I use is the uh, people working in pubs. You know, people people behind the bar in pubs. All the pubs were full shut. Um, and so the people that attend the bars weren't able to go to work. So the government said, right, rather than again using my example pubs laying off all their bar staff how about we support and we subsidize these people's wages that are unable to work because of the restrictions that we've we've put in place we'll subsidize their wages up to 80 percent so essentially the idea behind it is well look better than have a job to go back to than um than have a massive cliff edge of, of redundancies so that was the idea um, it was hugely expensive, um, billions and billions of pounds, um, but nevertheless, it does seem to have worked quite well. So, um, and I'll come on to this in a in a moment. But uh, but essentially, unemployment remains really quite relatively low um, a- across the UK, which is which is a very good thing. Um, so hopefully that that has that has worked out. Of course, Rishi Sunak is uh, giving himself a big pat on the back uh, already, um, but it's perhaps a little bit too early to tell. Um, so that scheme ended in September. So um, we're looking out for um, the next piece of unemployment data, which is out over the next couple of weeks, actually, um, as a real gauge as to whether when the scheme stopped and the government said, right, we're stopping paying these people's wages in September, whether they, whether these companies and businesses bought their staff back or whether they said, right, well, now we're not getting our 80%. Uh, it's actually trimmed a little bit below 80% toward the end. But um, now we're not getting our 80%. It's time to let these people leave. Um, so we'll we'll be monitoring those statistics over the next uh, next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, so broad, broadly speaking, and uh, so uh, so the coronavirus impact as well. One of the main things that we're following uh, is uh, the price of inflation, or the rates of inflation, I should say. Um, essentially, because there was no activity, and now all of a sudden people are going out and spending money. We've got supply chain bottlenecks where apparently it's very difficult to get uh, goods into the country. Um, price of fuel has gone through the roof. Uh, X, Y, and Z. In the price of inf- the rate of inflation has shot through the through the ceiling. Um, and we, well, I'll come on to this in a little bit. But we typically expect the Bank of England or the central bank, the respective central bank, to start uh, adjusting its monetary policy in response to that. Um, and um, and so yeah, so that's one of the main market drivers as far as cur- cur- uh, currency world is um, is concerned. So um, so people will probably be aware of this new mutation of the of the vir- virus. Um, it really hit the headlines on Friday the twenty sixth, just gone uh, last week, um, of a mutation out of South Africa. What we saw in the currency world was a real flight to safe havens. Um, much of the finance, many, many of the financial markets were uh, hit pretty hard. American stock indexes, UK stock indexes, price of oil, um, uh, price of gold. Um, and so risk sensitive currencies like the pound uh, were uh, lost, uh, you know, lost out to safe haven currencies like your Swiss franc, your dollar. As investors basically said, right, God, if we're going to have more lockdowns, we're better off having uh, holding dollars than more risky currencies like like the pound. So we saw the pound dip, um, and haven currencies in- increase. Um, so I think it's I personally I think it's too early to sort of panic about this. I've put down some of the stats that I've kind of collated. I mean, this is such a fast changing thing. These will probably be outdated already. Um, but I believe it's been found in over 23 countries already, including, of course, the UK. Actually, town what, the first case in the UK was actually found uh, in the next town where I used to live. Um, so right around the corner from me, which is which is fantastic. Um so, um, but yeah, but it's basically from what I understand uh, and from what the statistics are saying so far and the reports are saying, it's, the, the vaccines appear to be less 
effective. It seems to be more contagious for people that have already had the virus and developed kind of uh, natural immunity. Um, and it seems to be quite fast spreading. However, it does seem that the cases and the and the symptoms are much less severe. So depending on who you listen to, um, and you know, you'll all make up your own opinion on this. Um, it seems that it could be quite a good thing in, in the fact that it could spread quite quickly, have mild symptoms, and thus help move toward this kind of herd immunity thing. Alternatively, you know, if you if you take another view, it could spread very quickly and, and hospitalise a load of people and um, and be a, be a very, very bad thing. I think it's a little bit too early to tell. Um, but official uh, comments from from our kind of um, well, Chris Whitty, who's our chief medical officer, and, and Saji David, who's uh, the health minister. Um, Whitty said it's inevitable that the variant will travel across the globe. Um, he said that the other day. Uh, but Sajid uh, Javid said that um, the UK is nowhere near full lockdowns. This is the thing that we're looking at, looking at though, and this is the thing that will will make a big impact. Uh, are there going to be lockdowns? If there are lockdowns, the the economy will be impacted quite severely. If we avoid them, then hopefully the the impact of this will be will be muted. We'll see. Um, I mean, uh, Haley and I were talking about it before we came on, and um, I think we both kind of agree that it looks like a lockdown's coming. It all, it all sounds very much like here we go again. Um, so, so yeah, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, I, I, pers personally, I think they'll probably uh, try and eke it out until after Christmas and then chuck us into lockdown in, in January. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Hopefully not. Um, so what are we following and, and what, to, what to look out for moving forwards? So one of the main kind of market drivers as far as financial markets are concerned is the reaction and the divergences between central banks so the, you look at the federal reserve in the us they've already started trimming their bond buying program they're talking about raising interest rates fed fed chair powell said the other day that um that he he believes that they're dropping the word transitory something i'll mention in a second from from inflation in other words they they basically got it wrong uh, and they think that inflation is going to hang around for longer than they than they previously thought um, and so they're, they're talking about stopping their bond buying altogether, um, whereas the Bank of England, uh, and this is uh, the, perhaps one of the main things to look out for over the coming weeks, uh, the Bank of England have been widely expected to begin raising interest rates over the last uh, couple, of, couple of months, disappointed the market last month, um, and are widely or have been widely expected to hike interest rates uh, on December the 16th, which is the next meeting. Um, I think they will probably not now um, because of this mu new mutation um, so so yeah um, but broadly speaking higher interest rate uh, encourages it encourages spending increases the cost of borrowing um, uh, sorry it, it encourages encourages saving and um, diminishes the appeal of, of spending to a, to a muted degree we're talking about a tiny little raise in interest rates really um, but nevertheless um, it, it's, it's, it's deemed significant um, <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so the main three things and the things that the Bank of England have said they are looking at for cues as to to begin adjusting their monetary policy are inflation, uh, the unemployment rate linked to the end of furlough, as I mentioned before, uh, and consumer confidence and retail sales. Are people going out and spending their money or are they a little bit concerned about the future with the cost of living increasing? Are they are they stopping spending their money? Um, these are the things that, that, that the Bank of England are, are looking at. Uh, and we should be looking at too. Um, inflation continues to be labelled as transitory. So, um, so the Bank of England and many central banks across the world basically have said that look, these supply chain bottlenecks are going to go away. We'll see the cost of living uh, ease over the coming weeks, uh, over the coming months, uh, and thus it's not necessary to panic and start adjusting monetary policy because they want to basically support the economy out of this rut that it's been in. Um, but if inflation gets too high, of course, it makes it very difficult. Um, so inflation across the UK has risen to a 10 year high, 4.2 percent at the previous reading. Bank of England won it around about 2 percent. So it's a it's a it's a, it's an increasing concern. And considering the Fed have dropped the word transitory uh, at the, you know, in the last couple of days, it's a really interesting thing to to follow. <clears throat> um, central banks might be forced to adjust their monetary policy, uh, which is an interesting, interesting thing to, to follow, because how is that going to impact the, the people on the street, you know, the consumers, the, the people like you and I? Um, 
it's an interesting one, curious one. Um, unemployment continues to head in the right direction. It's down at 4.3%. We're, we're, we're relatively performing very, very well. Eurozone's about 7.5%. Um, they're going back into lockdowns as well. So, um, And I'll, I'll come on to how we're doing compared to the euro in, in a moment. Um, but yeah, retail sales continue to surpass, surpass expectation, up 0.8% in October compared to September. Continues to rise quite steeply um, in the run up to Christmas. Um, and the, the COVID case numbers as well. Another thing to follow, of course, um, what we're really in, not, not interested in, but what we're really following here is the pressure on the NHS. Because what the government did last time when they went into lockdown and, and, the, and the, the three lockdowns that we had in the UK, they were, they were basically doing it to protect the NHS. Um, they don't want the NHS to be overwhelmed, essentially, um, and stop people getting treatment. So, so what we're really looking at is not necessarily the case numbers; it's the kind of numbers of numbers of deaths, numbers of, numbers of available beds in hospitals. Um, and if that gets too high, then then the likelihood of lockdowns increases as well. Um, and what's going to happen in response to this new variant? You know, this is this is a, a fast moving thing. Let's see what happens there. Um, and the Bank of England, the next MPC meeting, Monetary Policy Committee meeting, December the 16th. Uh, will they raise interest rates or won't they? Um, markets will be disappointed if they don't. But I think increasingly over the next couple of weeks, you'll see a uh, uh, an, an amendment, uh, an adjustment to that. I think uh, I think the likelihood is that they will probably say, do you know what? We want to see how this new variant plays out. We're going to sit tight for now. That's what I think. Um uh, so are there positives? Yeah. So um, look, it all sounds very doomy and gloomy when I when I say about what's been going on. But unfortunately, we've had a really kind of crazy couple of years, right? And uh, I don't think anyone would would, uh, would disagree with me there. Um, so, but are there positives? Uh, yes, I, I, I believe so. So um, I think the, the UK is quite well positioned coming out of this um, the furlough scheme, uh, unemployment, the spending figures remain pretty robust. Um, but you've got the kind of Brexit plus coronavirus uncertainty um, hindering the pound. So I think it's a, it's a good time, as an, particularly as an international investor, to be buying in. Um, we've got um, so current record low interest rates as well. Again, all, all works in everyone's favour. Um, we're expecting Bank of England interest rate hikes uh, over the coming months. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I've mentioned the impact of the pound as well. So, so this is the this is I, I love to I love to uh, sorry show a chart and this is um, a sterling dollar chart over the last uh, twenty years something like that um, and hopefully you can see that actually we're on the really low end of and you want it as low as possible um, really low end as far as how markets favour the pound so we're still way below twenty sixteen levels which is when we if you look I don't know if you can see my cursor probably not but mid 2016 that's when we voted to leave Brexit no, leave the EU um and you can see we've we, we really haven't hit those highs since so we're still hindered by that Brexit uncertainty um which I think is going to go away you know give it enough time and it, and it will go away um of course you can see as well from the end of 2020 when we agreed that deal with the EU you can see how, how the pound sort of made its made its run um and this is a chart over the, the pandemic outbreak. So the real sharp line there um, in, in March last year, that's the when we went into lockdown, when the UK went into lockdown. So we can broadly expect something vaguely similar. I think it'd be less extreme this time around because, of course, we're a little bit more used to things like this now. Um, but if we do go back into lockdown, I would expect to see a significant uh, knock to the economy and thus the um, the, the, the pound, unfortunately, um, but good again for international investors looking to buy into the UK. Um, and broadly, though, the pound is performing pretty well against a, a kind of basket of currencies. Um, the, the, the dollar, of course, is a haven currency, it's considered a haven currency. So investors look to go into the dollar in times of global uncertainty and, and upheaval. Um, but broadly, the pound has done has done quite well over the last couple of months, and you can see here against the, the euro, the euro is an exceptional example because you've seen lockdown measures being reintroduced, um, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of kind of uh, unemployment's very high, the consumer confidence figures are very low, 
Um, it's kind of, and, and the ECB as well are seemingly a long way from from amending their policy. They're, they're still printing a load of euros, still got interest rates very, very low, and are basically saying that they have got no intention of raising or, or amending things anytime soon. And so it's that divergence between the Bank of England, who are saying, yes, we're ready to write hike interest rates. That's what kind of pushes the pound up a little bit. And um so yeah, that's hopefully what you can see in this in this chart here, um, and that I believe Haley is. Uh, if you're still there, if you, I haven't put you to sleep. Then this is about um, I'm about done. Brilliant, fantastic. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, so we've got Adeline. Um, uh, so she's or he? I don't know. <laughs> I'm terrible at pronunciation. I've probably pronounced that wrong as well. Um, but we have a question about interest rates. So the increase in interest rates. So are you referring to savings rates or borrowing? Rate? The the benchmark rate. So it'll affect both. Yeah. yeah. So it, it it will affect both. Um, so you're talking about the Bank of England um, uh, increasing their base rate, aren't you, basically? Yeah. Um, and then uh, Helen has asked, uh, does the minus on the right before the number mean anything? <laughs> I'm surprised you can even see that chart. I'm, I mean, I'm blind as a bat, but <laughs> I can't see it. No, um, I don't know what you mean there, uh, Adeline. I'm, um, uh, Helen, sorry. Okay, um, so, um, sorry, Helen, we can't answer that question. Both me and Nick are blind and can't see what part no, of the chart well, you're referring to. Right, I'm the worst part of the chart, like that. Um, <laughs> probably not, though, is my, uh, is my impression. I mean, if, if you're talking about a currency chart, it shouldn't be a minus on there. I think she's talking about the numbers down the right-hand side. Um with the minus one and then oh no 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 so that's just that's just the level that's all it's just it's just saying this is where 118 is or you know whatever 119 is brilliant we got there in the in sorry the yeah I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> so mike's got a question for you um so what do you think the best time to move money from euro um <laughs> uh to gb uh obviously g uh, bp my, Mike always uh, yeah. asks me to stick my neck on the line. He, he never lets me down. Um, <laughs> no, um, Mike, you're not on a recorded line. He can't give you actual advice. <laughs> <laughs> but my opinion, I, 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 as I say, I, I think we're gonna. I think the Bank of England will disappoint in December, um, and so I think I'd certainly be waiting for that. Um, yeah, that's. I, 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 I've got to admit, I was super. Ex- surprised that they didn't raise it um before I know, we spoke about this so, didn't we so yeah. if they don't again I, I i really don't know what's going on and everything i rely on normally <laughs> is kind of like okay this is completely out of norm isn't it really <laughs> yeah I, but i think i, I was i was when, when we spoke about it last time obviously it was before this omicron stuff wasn't it and um i i was i was certain that we'd see a hike in December. Yeah. Um, but obviously the last week has thrown a real spanner in the plan. And, and I think they will they will probably say, let's hold out until January or, or the yeah. new year, just to see how it plays out. Because I, I also feel like they're, they're kind of teeing us up for a bit of a lockdown, whether it's partial, localised, whatever. Yeah. So I, I think they'll probably hold off. But uh, and, and so that's, that's, that's what I would be waiting for. I'll be waiting for, perhaps for the new lift. Yeah. And I, I, I do think it's going to be worldwide again. I mean, I was talking, I think Nancy's on the call. I was talking to Nancy yesterday and um, it's looking, you know, similar in Australia, another lockdown. And, you know, so this is kind of a conversation that's happening throughout the whole of the world. And it, it does yeah. kind of feel like it's ground zero again, all kind of happening again, doesn't it? So yeah. it's, a, it's a little bit uh, disappointing, I suppose. But, uh, mm. you know, uh, really that, you know, we can only, adapt and change and obviously look at what what's happening and and move with the flow really mm. we have no other choice mm. <laughs> so. but, but, I mean, that's a, it's a good point that you made though is that we of course when we're talking about currencies we're talking about it like respectively so it's yeah. you know if, yeah. are australia in lockdown are the uk in lockdown and you know that's yeah. gonna yeah. that's gonna impact things you know rather than just oh the uk is in lockdown it's going to go down across the board or the pound's going to go down across the board not necessarily so it's how are we you know 
in comparison. In comparison. Yeah, yeah. So Mike said your opinion is perfectly fine. Um, Thanks, and, Mike. Uh, <laughs> Nancy has a question again. Um, so Nancy said, what do you expect to happen to the pound next year if the UK were to come to another lockdown? Yeah, I, I think we'll see a sterling weakness if we do lock down. Again, relative to where, you know, whichever currency you look currency pair you're looking at um, but I don't think it's going to be as extreme you know when we when we saw the first lockdown in March 2020 we, we lost 15 percent in in like two days um I, I don't think we're going to see anything like that again but I do think that a lot of hope was pinned on the fact that we're now out of it and to go back down it back through it again I think we'll well it's it's obviously not good right um so so yeah I, I, I the pound will weaken if we lock down probably less so, you know, three, four percent, something like that um, is, is what I would expect. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, well, Nick, you were awesome, as always. Would have been even better if you'd have popped the Christmas tree I'm and sorry. put the balls on your ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I'll let you off. Um, there's always next year. Uh, we'll do a Christmas jumper special next year. <laughs> so everybody's saying thank you very much. Um, I'm sure I will speak to you again before Christmas, but if I don't, have a wonderful Christmas. And thank you so much for your time this morning well, again. <laughs> no, no, thanks for having me as always. And uh, hopefully everyone found it a little bit interesting uh, and I didn't put anyone to sleep. But, uh, but I do wish you all a very Merry Christmas. If I don't speak to you all and uh, Happy New Year. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Let's Take hope care. we don't get locked down. Yes, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All Take the best. Care. I'm going to go. Bye-bye. So um, we are going to now jump on to um, my kind of leading off from uh, Nick's update. So I've tried to focus on property related. Um, so I'm going to jump on uh, off camera here and um, just go through the market update. And then any questions that you may have, general or otherwise, um, pop them in the chat box and we'll have opportunity to uh, go through those at the end. Um, it's a shorter market update than usual because we've had Nick who's done a, the economy update and the overall update. Um, so it's very much just property related. So uh, today's headlines then, or let's look at the, the, the major headlines. Um, so property sales um, plummet um, as the market heads for hibernation. Uh, so property dropped dramatically in October. We always see a drop like this after the end of a tax break. And we also tend to see buyers hunker down for the winter. Um, uh, so the combination of the two was always going to mean a quite a few months ahead. The monthly drop looks spectacular, though, as the sales almost halved. Um, but this was from an, enorm an enormous peak um, created by the final stamp duty holiday deadline. A major chunk of sales uh, we would have uh, uh, otherwise expected this winter rushed through in time for the deadline um, of uh, September. The drop from the free previous October was um, also impressively steep. Um, this was from an unusually busy October in 2020. Uh, again, uh, a combination of the market closing the previous spring and the stamp duty holiday lighting a fire under buyers uh, meant ramped up um, through, uh, meant sales were ramped up through last winter. Um, we knew this fall was coming. And we're not expecting it to pick up again in the immediate future. It's normal. Um, uh, usually after a spike like this, we get a quieter period. Add the fact that we uh, usually get sales tailing off at this end of the year um, uh, or at the end of any year um, and season um, uh, around December and in through to January anyway. Um, and it's uh, fair to expect a degree of, of hibernation, as I said. Um, this will uh, be compounded uh, by the fact that the number of properties coming to the market has fallen for seven months in a row. And the average agent has seen just 37 properties on its books. Uh, with new listings and available stock at its lowest levels of stock in over a decade, even if people are keen to buy, uh, there's hardly anything on the market for them. However, we're not expecting the market to remain dormant for long. And while mortgage rates have crept up slightly, there are still some phenomenally cheap deals around um, in which uh, is enough to support, uh, in my opinion, activity in the marketplace. That's, of course, assuming we don't get 
a, a big uh, interest rate shock. Um, uh, we can expect the market to be bright eyed and bushy tailed again by the spring of next year. Um, so there may be a short window for investors to buy at a more reasonable price and a little less competition than the usual, or at least that that we've seen over the last 12 months. Uh, there is a clear shift in, the, in uh, transaction levels. Um, so let's look at some stats for that. So UK monthly property transactions commentary. So this was updated on the 23rd of November 2021. And um, so UK monthly prompt property transaction statistics states, and this is from gov.uk, um, so temporary increase in nil rate bans for UK residential property taxes and the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic have both produced significant uncertainties underlying, underlying um, seasonal trends um, since around April 2020. Uh, seasonally adjusted statistics should therefore be treated with additional caution. So this was one of the headlines, shock horror. Um, so headline statistics read then, uh, the latest UK monthly property transactions data shows that the provisional seasonally adjusted estimate of UK residential transactions in October 2021 is 28.2% lower than October 2020 and 52% lower than September 2021. So quite a significant drop. The provisional seasonally adjusted estimate of UK non-residential transactions in October um, is in, in October 2021, however, is 10.4% higher than October 2020 and, and 1% higher than September 2021. So as a side note and off piece slightly, it's the simple rules of supply and demand. Many investors have moved to commercial or commercial to residential um, as this market has been hit hard over the last 10 years um, and opportunity has presented itself with buying low and um, bagging a bargain as such, but also with the new class MAE uh, class commercial to residential um, C3 under the PD it's actually drove this market um, and uh, a lot of interest um, within a commercial to residential and commercial as a whole um, so buying at the bottom of the market repurposing um, at the height of the market Anyway, a bit off piece there. Um, so Rob Horton, uh, CEO of Really Moves, commented, um, transaction volumes are unsurprisingly down since the end of stamp duty holiday, but the outlook for housing market in early 2022 is positive. The most intense phase of the post-pandemic boom has now subsided, bringing about a brief autumn lull. But the fundamental supply and demand imbalance continues to support prices and while the threat of interest rate rises will give some buyers pause for thought um, thanks to the stress testing by lenders most homeowners however will be able to absorb small interest rates over an extended period interest rate rises over an extended period of time without too much trouble House price inflation for first-time buyers has been lower than for upsizers and downsizers, meaning uh, first-time buyers' actively, uh, level, activity levels are reassuringly high at around 54% of all buyers. An encouraging sign of market health, an anticipated surge in new listings in the new year will drive activity, boost transaction levels, and help existing sellers to complete chains. How many of you think he's right? Let me know in the chat box. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Um, so Tim Jordan then um, did a special feature. For those of you that don't know who Tim is, uh, he's a residential property expert at SAS Daniels. Um, so he says... Um, or did uh, a special feature and, and commented. Among the many things he spoke about um, during his interview, one of the very interesting topics was down valuations and the impact of them. We've spoken about this many, many times over the last 12 months, and I've experienced it. Many of you that are actively buying have experienced it as well. So I thought it'd be good to kind of pop this in there. Um, so now I've, uh, I, I, you know, uh, what, what, let's have a look at what, he's, uh, what he says. Um, 
in such a market where the sellers, uh, uh, the seller is Lord and King, uh, for those of you that know Paul, he likes to call himself Lord, um, and the supply remains low, um, we've seen a number of properties being downvalued. Um, so this occurs when a surveyor values a home at less than the price agreed by the buyer and the seller. The buyer then has a number of choices. They can either appeal the valuation, which will, which will be 99.9% .9 of, the, of the time, um, as, as far as I've con uh, concerned and what I've seen. And in the absence of finding a new lender as well, um, uh, you're, pardon my French, screwed basically, if you're downvalued and you're not looking to move with another lender, um, then you really don't have much um, much success rate in terms of overthrowing the valuation and getting it increased. Um, so um, you really are uh, kind of screwed in that scenario. Um, but what we are seeing is um, that you can you, you can do that. So you can either make up um, the shortfall. Uh, you could, of course, renegotiate the asking price or find the additional cash um, to make up the difference, which is what a huge percentage have claimed to do. Um, for some none of um, for some, none of those actually, none of those routes um, uh, would be plausible and down values uh, or valuation disruptions um, may uh, uh, or have um, and continue to um, uh, actually hinder uh, many house sales over um, recent months and I suspect into the future as well. It is, however, unclear whether buyers have been overpaying to get transactions over the line um, and take advantage of a stamp duty cut um, while they were available, or if lenders are just um, being particularly cautious in a volatile market where there are concerns over the overall future of the economy. Regardless, with demand outstripping supply and uh, multiple buyers for each property, it stands to reason that uh, there is more chance of buyers getting into a bidding war and paying over the odds. In fact, recent research by Evia uh, found uh, nearly a quarter of home buyers paid over the asking price during the pandemic, and sadly, half of the UK buyers now regret how much they paid. Um, Maybe we will see them that, uh, selling next year. Um, a, a joke, obviously. <laughs> but impulse buying, as many of us ladies know, is never, ever a good decision. Right, so that's the kind of uh, house transactions, uh, residential and commercial kind of statistics there for sales in the UK um, over the last few months. So let's have a look at rent. Um, so rent for private uh, rental housing or demand for private rental housing is at a record high. Um, so research shows a survey of private rent uh, landlords across England and Wales conducted on behalf of the National Residential Landlords Association found that 57 percent um, confirmed that demand for homes to rent had increased in the third quarter of 2021, up from 39 percent in the second quarter of the year. Landlords operating in London have seen a significant uptick in demand um, compared to the levels reported throughout the pandemic as workers now return to the capital. Um, some 68% of landlords operating in outer London reported demand having increased up from 25% in the third quarter of 2020. In central London, over half, 54%, reported increased demand up from 16% on this time last year. Elsewhere, landlords operating in South Wales or South West sorry, reported the strongest demand with 79% um, saying that demand had increased in the third quarter of the year. This was followed by 74% in South East, excluding London, and 73% in Wales and 71% in the West Midlands. Despite the booming demand, many landlords plan to reduce the number of properties they rent out. It's been a hard knock for many landlords and many have figured enough is enough. Um, sell while the prices are high and invest elsewhere. Again, be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Are you a landlord um, uh, that is thinking there's far too much red tape these days and looking to uh, get out and invest elsewhere um, or in different strategies? Let us know in the chat box. Um, 
Too much red tape and almost two years of nonsense and footing the bill, taking responsibility for tenants where the government should have stepped in. Uh, bans on evictions, etc. Uh, Christ, the list goes on. Um, and uh, the UK relies on private uh, landlords. Uh, someone really should tell the government that um, and local private sector housing officers um, that quite clearly um, uh, have issues with uh, private, uh, uh, the private sector. Anyway, a bit of a rant there. Um, so uh, Ben Beagle, Chief Executive of uh, uh, National Residential Landlord Association says, uh, or says, uh, as demand picks up following lockdown measures, we need a stimulus to support responsible landlords to provide the homes to rent we vitally need. Without this, it is uh, ultimately, um, or without this, it will ultimately be tenants that suffer as a result of less choice, higher rents, and uh, resulting uh, in difficulties they will encounter when looking to become uh, homeowners. Um, if they qualify. Um, so um, while we're on the rents, let's uh, talk about another um, uh, topic or very topical uh, thing at this moment in time, and um, that is EPC. Um, so Property Mark commented on the mortgage works research showing landlords consider selling up with uh, concern for meeting the looming green EPC deadlines. Um, so I've done a few shows about this. So um, Many of you may have, I can see lots of familiar faces online. Many of you already uh, may have covered this off with me. But um, let's just look at um, headlines again. So the report by Mortgage Works published on the 1st of December highlighted that 52% of impacted landlords have thought about selling some of or some or all of their properties because they don't think they'll be able to uh, either com complete or finance uh, the work uh, to reach the required EPC standards. Um, Timothy Dudless says, uh, as domestic energy use accounts for 14% of overall UK emissions and 90% of homes in England currently use fossil fuels, um, improving the energy efficiency of the nation's housing stock is one of the most significant challenges in reaching net zero emissions. Private rented sector has its part to play, uh, but in recent years, landlords have faced considerable legislative Legistr I can't say that. <laughs> legislative changes and during the during a time of financial strain due to the COVID-19 pandemic um, which will continue to uh, have lasting effects the cost of bringing housing stock up to EPC band C will be a significant challenge for many. If the alarming number of landlords who have considered selling up uh, within the Mortgage Works report go on to do so, it will have a detrimental effect on uh, not only the UK um, government's ad, uh, admit ambitions to reach net zero, but also for the thousands of renters looking to be housed as stock levels um, deplete. In some parts of the UK, this will uh, put additional burdens on local authorities and increase demand for social rented housing as not everyone can afford to buy. To support the uh, longevity of the private rented sector, the government uh, must introduce realistic and achievable targets that take into account the diversity of the country's housing stock. Furthermore, without in incentives and sustained funding options uh, that landlords can tap into, it is unlikely that the government's proposal for energy efficiency will be met. So, um, lots of hits this year, lots of changes in our industry, um, some good and some not so good. Um, it's been a very strange market, uh, false in so many ways, uh, a hard year for investors and landlords in so many ways too. Uh, but it's also been a, a year of change and growth um, for many. And I, for one, um, I'm truly thankful for that. Um, I've still purchased many deals this year. I've set up new businesses. I've built exciting new relationships with some of the best people in the industry. And I've pushed myself uh, professionally and personally. And uh, 
overall grown as an individual. And that's very much what I've seen from people that have come through your freedom empire, people that I meet and speak to through other networks. Um, and that's kind of the feeling I'm getting from everyone. Of course, the icing on the cake for me as well was moving house this year, which um, I couldn't be happier with. Um, so overall, I'm truly, truly grateful for this year. And uh, and uh, I, the life and the universe has a funny way of uh, celebrating um, or clearing out the old, let's say, and uh, making way for the new. Um, so hopefully that's kind of been, you know, the year for everyone. Um, and um 2021 wasn't everyone's year, but it, it was most definitely mine and has been most definitely mine. And I continue to celebrate it right up to the very end. <laughs> um, so thank you to everyone uh, that, that has been part of this year, no matter how big or small, for those of you that join, for those of you that watch the replay on YouTube, which I know is a lot. Um, and for those of you that have come through our training, for those of you that are part of our networks and actively get involved, thank you so much. Um, you are, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm looking forward to, um, you know, doing more of this next year and getting more and more involved and growing even more um, as a collective group and family. Um, but I am looking forward to winding down this year now. Um, and uh, lots of eggnog, as I said, lots of mince pies, popcorn, um, family time and Father Christmas is very much what's on the cards. I can love in all of the messages coming through saying Merry Christmas. Thank you ever so much. Um, so hopefully you all like my reindeer ears that uh, have bells on. <laughs> I quite like, I might actually wear these for the rest of the year. Um, uh, but so that was the market update. We do, of course, have um, uh, any questions that you have in the chat box I'll go through now. I'll kind of try and sift them out. So we've got a few. This is me minus before. Uh, so actually they're all for Nick um, what do you expect to happen with a parent opinion is fine uh, so I think um, so Mike has a question um, so uh, is your so in your opinion um, that quarter one 2022 um, is an even better time to invest than normal um, so I would say that as I think that we will start seeing an uptake in the market, I don't think that it's going to um, be in hibernation for very long. So really, the opportunities would be between now and into the, the first quarter of next year. Um, I think by the time we get into the second quarter, um, uh, we will uh, have new stock to the market. Um, uh, although demand has dropped off and the, the fire lit under buyers as a result of the stamp duty holidays, no longer a driving force, I do think that we'll start seeing, we have a stable housing market, so we're not going to see huge crashes or anything like that, Mike. Um, but there will be um, less competition in the market between now and um, uh, throughout the first quarter of next year. So if there's an opportunity, that's the window that, that I kind of see. I do think that the growth will slow down. So we're not going to see the growth that we've seen over the last 12 months with house prices. And I do think we will, uh, which we needed it to kind of slow down, especially as investors, uh, we needed less competition in the market as well. Um, so I do think that we are going to um, uh, see increases in housing prices, um, but a much more stable um, uh, and uh, normal market condition. Um, so there has been a clear shift and uh, that is clear within the statistics um, uh, uh, as I've gone through um, in this market update. And we continue to monitor that. So we will be back on in January. So the first week of January with another market update, which which will just look at the statistics that we've gone through today and then confirm them in January to um, see if there are any changes or any trends that we're seeing. And so we'll, we'll continually keep you updated, Mike, but that's kind of my opinion. And um, we always see less uh, activity in the market from residential perspective. Um, so people looking to buy their homes um, at this time of the year, the year. So as investors, we do get out there. As I said, I'm actually going 
going to view a property after this webinar today. Um, so uh, as investors, there's always opportunity. And of course, the, the, we can buy um, with less competition uh, where most people are hunkering down and hibernating for the winter. Um, uh, that's when we get our wellies on, our big fluffy jackets, hats, scarf and gloves and get out there viewing in uh, the miserable, dark, damp um, uh, weather here in the UK. Um, so hopefully that answers your questions. Loads of Merry Christmases coming through. So thank you so much. Um, we've got a question coming through from Nancy. Uh, would you think that property prices will decrease in the second quarter and onwards? I don't think that we're going to see a huge decrease. Um, we will obviously have micro markets and there will be some areas that will drop. Uh, but I don't think that the drops are going to be significant. Um, and I don't think that we're going to see a market crash. So I do think overall we will have a stable housing market here in the UK. And I think what's really um, uh, really holding that together is the clear lack of uh, new listings uh, supply coming to the market. So while demand has dropped off um, dramatically, the supply is at an all-time low. Well, not an all-time low, but a, 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 the lowest available stock coming to market in over a decade. Um, so that is really keeping the housing market stable. And that, that problem is not going to be solved anytime soon. So I don't think that we're going to see a decrease, um, uh, but there will be, of course, regional um, uh, differences. Uh, but overall, as an average, um, I think that we will see um, uh, more in line with normal, normal market conditions, three to 5% um, growth year on year. So we are not going back to the days of 10% inflation year on year. Um, uh, so I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but there is going to be a window of opportunity for you to take advantage of and buy um, arguably with less competition, which means you can negotiate um, on the purchase price. Um, and, uh, and it's up to you as active investors to obviously find that opportunity and, and uh and get in there. It's as I've said many times before, I've purchased throughout the whole of this year. Uh, I did last year as well. Um, what's happening with the market really doesn't differ, stop us from investing. We are investors. You can only call yourself an investor if you're investing. <laughs> um, so what you did 10 years ago doesn't count. Um, so um, I always say it's not about timing the marketplace correctly. While we can take advantage of where we are within a market cycle and look at statistics and get in there when a window of opportunity presents um, itself to us, um, we should always be actively looking for deals. We should always be open for business. We should always be running the numbers and um, we should always be uh, it, it, if we're active investors, we should be investing. So we can make it work in any market. It's not about time in the market. It's about time in the marketplace. And um, as we as we know, um, you know, property is uh, all the real wealth in property is uh, taking income from that on a, a monthly basis, holding it over a long period of time and um, also benefiting from the forced appreciation that you should have put in there <laughs> um, as a result of adding value um, and um, also the capital appreciation year on year um, uh, as a bonus as well. So we can take money now and in the future, regardless of what market we are in. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, so uh, I can't see any more questions coming through. So if you do have any questions, put them in the chat box. But I'm just going to quickly talk to you about the events that we have on uh, this year. Uh, oh, next year, <laughs> this year, not so much, um, finished for this year. Um, so our next property success convention um, is on the 29th and the 30th of January. So this is live in class um, and uh, also virtual as well. So for those of you that um, want to dial in virtually, you can attend via Zoom. Um, and for those of you that would like to come and see us um, and meet us in person, um, you can come along to our headquarters. You can get signed up for that it is free to attend and it's jam-packed full of content information market updates um, power teams um, and it's a very very relaxed um, uh, two days um, and it's very much introducing you to your freedom empire what we're all about and giving you great content as well 
Many people attend um, uh, and attend more than once and learn something new every single time. So um, if you want to join us in January, um, kick off the new year with a positive vibe um, and um, uh, get light the fire underneath yourself after all of those mince pies over Christmas, um, then uh, get signed up to that. Uh, you can do that through our website uh, or on the link uh, on the screen now. Then, of course, we also have um, John Howard's um, uh, com fully comprehensive advanced property developing and investing. And so uh, we have uh, it. The, it was so successful the first time round. Um, we've decided that we are doing it again. Uh, we have the wonderful John Howard, who is phenomenal uh, with four decades, 40 years in the industry. Um, brought and sold over 4,000 uh, houses, apartments, etc., and uh, has four great books out and, and just a phenomenal all-round good guy um, and uh, uh, very, very funny as well. So a great two days. Um, if you are advanced, you've been purchasing property in the UK um, and uh, you want to move into more complex strategies and get access to John, his joint venture funds, etc., cetera, um, then this is definitely the, uh, the course for you. Um, so grab your tickets. The link is on uh, the screen now. Um, you can also go to our website and, and uh, book your tickets through the website also. Phenomenal course. Um, and then, of course, if you, oh, we're actually on, um, so it's the 8th of December at 8 o'clock on channel uh, 191 Sky. Um, you can watch the premiere on our YouTube channel as well, for those of you that don't have Sky. So um, I believe it's 8 o'clock on the 8th of uh, December. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong, check us out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, etc. because we always put reminders out. So you will be able to check the date anyway. <laughs> um, but I believe uh, the next episode to come out, which is a very, very interesting episode, talking about hotspots around the UK, um, what hotspots I believe um, are producing best yields, etc. and why, and also prop tech as well from a very, very um, intelligent um, guy for those of you that love data which of course I do uh, Richard is one of the new guests on the show as well and so pop along and watch that let us know your thoughts ask any questions send them through to our support um, structure and we're more than happy to to answer and of course, we're still doing these calls. Um, so there are limited availability because I am officially now uh, on holiday. <laughs> um, but we still do these one-to-one um, uh, -one consultation calls. I've really loved doing them over the last 12 months and enjoyed meeting all of you um, and, um, and just generally talking about what you've been getting up to. It's given me a great way of understanding other people's experiences and uh, helping you kind of overcome challenges um, and uh, I've I've absolutely loved being part of this. Um, so it's one of my favourite things that I've done this year. Um, and I really do gen genuinely feel like we're we're helping, and it is free. Um, so if you would like to book a call in with us and discuss where you are, what you're looking to do, or perhaps you're stuck on something at this moment in time and just want to run it past an expert and get a general opinion, um, uh, then book yourself a call in. You can do that through our website. Um, off the education hub um, option menu, um, or you can do it through the link on screen now. And of course, um, we are back in January. So the first week of January, the first Friday of January, if you would like any questions answered, um, uh, you can pop them through in anticipation for that show, and we will get them answered on the show. And that way, then if you're not able to make it live, but you do watch the replay on YouTube, you still get your questions answered. Um, and also anything that you would like us to cover. So um, of course, this year, we've taken feedback from our listeners on who you would like us to bring in, um, uh, what topics you would like to cover. So our guests are very much tailored around what you guys want to listen to. This is very much a forever free webinar. It's there to help you in your journey. Um, and it's our way of giving back. Um, so if there are any topics or any specific parts of the power team that you'd like to speak to, any topics that you'd like us to cover or anything like that, pop an email through to admin at yourfreedomempire.co.uk. And we'll make sure that we get them on the agenda for next year. But I'm going to say, 
have a very, very Merry Christmas. Um, I will see some of you on the support um, uh, alumni session um, next week. Um, but um, I'm going to love you and leave you. Wish you all a, a very, very Merry Christmas. Um, stay safe. Have fun. Enjoy your family. Don't work too hard. Um, and uh, we're here ready and waiting for you next year. Uh, but I'm going to say goodbye for now. Take care.